Let's take a look at de Broglie matter waves. Back in 1924, Prince Louis de Broglie predicted the existence of matter waves. And his reasoning must have been along the lines of, we usually think of electromagnetic waves as waves, but they have a particle nature. And that's where we talk about wave-particle duality. He wanted to take that one step farther. And he said, well, what about things that we usually think of as particles, like let's say an electron, would it have a wave nature? And if it did have a wave nature, well, how big would the wavelength be? Now, we can go through kind of an ad hoc uh, argument as to what his reasoning must have been in terms of predicting this wavelength for an electron or a particle with matter. So if we start with the wave side of the equation, we're talking about, say, electromagnetic waves, then the particle would be the photon. And we know the energy of a photon will be h times the frequency of that radiation. Now we can write that in terms of the wavelength because we know from the universal wave equation that c is equal to f times lambda or v is equal to f times lambda. That means we can write our photon energy as being h times c over the wavelength. Now if I rearrange this for the wavelength I get h times c divided by the energy of the photon. So, so far all we've got is an equation for the wavelength of a photon. Now we want to start thinking in terms of mass. And we know there's a relationship between mass and energy. And that is that E equals mc squared. So that we could think in terms of how much equivalent energy would the mass of, say, an electron be. And it would be given by E equals mc squared. So now, for our de Broglie wavelength, we can put hc divided by mc squared. So we replace photon energy by the equivalent mass energy. And now we make our final step. We can cross out a c, or cancel out a c, and then we want to think in terms of m times c. Well, that's mass times speed of light, but of course we're talking about something with matter, and something with matter won't move the speed of light, it will move at some speed v, which is going to be less than the speed of light. And so if we make that kind of simple substitution, then we get a wavelength for matter equal to h divided by mv, and of course m times v is just the momentum of that particle. So you usually see the de Broglie wavelength written as h divided by p, the momentum of the particle. And that's our formula for the de Broglie wavelength. So de Broglie makes his prediction for the wavelength and then he issues a challenge out there to all the experimentalists and he says can you design an experiment so that we can prove that this is really the wavelength of an electron. And the two guys that answer the call are Clint Davison and Lester Germer. They know that the primary thing that, that waves do, that particles don't do, is interference or diffraction. Particles will not do interference or diffraction. But they also know that the only way that you see interference and diffraction is when the size of your slit, the size of your obstacle, is similar in size to the wavelength. So what they've got to do is use de Broglie's formula and try to calculate what would be a typical wavelength for an electron. So let's suppose that we, so let's say we take a fast moving electron. So let's say it's moving at 100,000 meters per second. We want to calculate what the de Broglie wavelength would be. Okay, so he substitutes in. There's Planck's constant. Here's the mass of the electron. That's in kilograms. And this would be the speed of the electron in meters per second. Do that calculation and you get an answer of about 10 to the minus 10 meters. So they're thinking, okay, well, what in the real world has a size of about 10 to the minus 10 meters. And hopefully you're aware of the fact that the size of an atom is about 10 to the minus 10 meters. So this is one of those orders of magnitudes that you're supposed to remember in this course. So remember an atom 10 to the minus 10 meters, a nucleus about 100,000 times smaller or five orders of magnitude smaller at 10 to the minus 15 meters. So their idea is we're going to send some electrons onto a, a crystal because the atoms are going to be separated by about 10 to the minus 10 meters. And so they'll kind of form a diffraction grating. 
and we should be able to get some sort of diffraction pattern. And of course, the primary thing that you see when you've got a diffraction pattern is you'll see places where the electrons show up and then the intensity really drops and then the intensity comes back up again. So the intensity will go up in certain places, drop down and then come back again. Particles never do that, but waves do. So what they did was they used a nickel crystal, they fired the electrons at it, so they accelerated the electrons through a voltage, sent lots of electrons onto this crystal here, and then they had a detector over here, and this detector would register the number of electrons that are hitting as this angle here is changed. Now I don't want to go into the geometry of this very much, but you can imagine you've got uh, two nickel atoms right here, they have a certain spacing between them, and waves would come in and reflect off those atoms. And the waves reflecting off the atoms could interfere with each other. And so once again, if you can fit an integral number of wavelengths into that path difference, then you're going to get a pattern of constructive interference. And that would mean if this is equal to an integral number of wavelengths, you're going to get a high intensity at that particular angle here. Of course, as you veer away from that angle, then the path difference will no longer be at one whole wavelength, and you won't get that perfect constructive interference, and the intensity is going to drop off. So this is what their data looked like. They did get a, they got a peak right here at, at an angle of 50 degrees. And then the intensity, it drops off, and then it comes back again. And that's a diffraction pattern. And when they did all their calculations, they found out that the de Broglie wavelength exactly predicted that the maximum would occur at 50 degrees. So Davison and Germer not only showed that you got a diffraction pattern, they verified that the de Broglie wavelength was correct. What you're seeing below is two images. One is made with x-rays and the other is made with electrons. But the wavelength of the x-rays is exactly the same as the de Broglie wavelength of the electrons. So these two wavelengths are the same. And what you're seeing here is an interference or diffraction pattern. So for instance, right in here you're not getting any x-rays. And then you're getting lots of x-rays and then no x-rays and lots of x-rays, no x-rays, lots of x-rays, etc. And same pattern with the electrons. And you're seeing the, the high intensity places occurring at exactly the same places for the electrons as for the x-rays. And that's because the wavelengths are the same. So right here we're getting lots of electrons, then no electrons, lots of electrons, no electrons, no lots of electrons, none, etc. So only waves can do this. P particles in themselves can't do it, but particles exhibiting their wave nature can do this type of diffraction pattern. Okay, we've got this de Broglie wavelength. What happens when we look at the de Broglie wavelength of, say, a macroscopic object, like a baseball, or in this case, a wine bottle? And in this case, it's not really a wine bottle. This is actually their experimental apparatus here. So the wavelength is going to be given by Planck's constant divided by the momentum, which is the mass times the speed. So we've got to make up a mass and make up a speed for our wine bottle. Let's take nice simple numbers. Let's say the the mass of the wine bottle is about one kilogram. And let's say we throw it at 10 meters per second. Of course, Planck's constant is 6.63 .63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. And so we're going to get an answer of about order of magnitude of about 10 to the minus 35 meters. 10 to the minus 35 meters is a small number. In fact, there's nothing that we know of in the universe that is that small. We're never going to get diffraction effects or interference effects on macroscopic objects. It's just going to happen for subatomic particles. So you don't have to worry about, let's say, you're walking through a door. You don't have to worry that as you walk through that door, you're going to diffract. And some of the time, you'll go straight through, but other times you'll end up over here or maybe over here. You'll never end up over here or over here. So anyways, you don't have to worry about that. That's not going to happen for macroscopic objects. 
Now, typically, the type of objects that you're dealing with is, is electrons, and you accelerate them through some voltage. So a meaningful problem, a problem that often comes up in the IB, is to calculate the wavelength of an electron when it is accelerated through a given voltage. So the type of energy transformation that we're talking about is going to be a loss of electric potential energy as that electron gets accelerated across the plates and it's going to result in a gain in speed or a gain in kinetic energy for that electron. So it's really, we're really just going to use QV equals work. But the work is going into changing the kinetic energy. So uh, our gain in kinetic energy, assuming it starts from rest, would be a half mv squared. I'm going to write that as p squared over 2m. Now if you're not familiar with a half mv squared being equal to p squared over 2m, what you have to do is, remember p is equal to mv. So then if I square both sides, I'll get p squared equals m squared times v squared. And then if I divide both sides by 2m, and m will cancel out, and I'll get a half mv squared. So a half mv squared, or kinetic energy, is the same as p squared over 2m. And that is in your data booklet. Now the loss in electric potential energy, it's just going to equal the charge, in this case it's the charge of an electron, accelerated through a voltage v. Now the next thing that we want to do is we want to get rid of that momentum and put it in terms of the de Broglie wavelength. So we know the relationship is that the de Broglie wavelength is equal to h over p and that means that p is equal to h divided by lambda and that's what we're going to substitute in here for p. So we make our substitution, we replace p by h over lambda so p is going to become h squared divided by lambda squared and then we'll have a 2m on the bottom and that will equal e times the voltage. Now let's rearrange that for lambda. Lambda squared will be equal to h squared all over 2m times ev. Taking the square root of both sides we'll get that lambda is equal to h all over 2m ev square root. Okay, so let's substitute the numbers in and see what we get for our wavelength. h is 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. That would be joules times seconds. And then we've got to divide that by the square root of all these numbers too. Mass of an electron, you can look that up in your data booklet. It's 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Times the charge of an electron, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, and that's in coulombs, and the voltage we're accelerating it through is a thousand volts. And if we multiply that all out, we should get an answer of 3.9 times 10 to the minus 11 meters. So we're talking, once again, of the order 10 to the minus 10 meters if we accelerate through a thousand volts. Okay, a few IB questions. Read over the question, try it out, and then come back for the answer. Okay, so in this one, we're going back to that equation that we just derived but a second ago, which was lambda equals h divided by the square root of 2me times v. So you can see here that lambda varies as 1 over the square root of the voltage. And so that would be answer D. Another IB question, read it over, try it out, and then come back for the answer. Okay, so for this one, we've got the same de Broglie wavelength. And if we have the same de Broglie wavelength, of course, the de Broglie wavelength is given by h over p. h is a constant, so that means that our momenta must be the same. So that would mean that the mass of the proton times the speed of the proton must equal the mass of the alpha particle times the speed of the alpha particle. Now, an alpha particle, it's got two protons and two neutrons, so it's got four nucleons in total. So we can say that it's got four times the mass of a proton or a neutron, whereas over here we've just got the mass of the proton. And we're looking for the ratio of the speeds. So the speed of the alpha particle divided by the speed of the proton, we can cancel out those masses, is going to equal 1 over 4 
And that means the correct answer is answer A. Another IB question, I'll read it over, try it out, and then come back for the answer. So the de Broglie hypothesis, so the correct answer here is D. It can even apply to baseballs. It's just there's nothing small enough in the universe so that the baseball could show its wave nature and diffract. One more IB question, read it over, try it out, and then come back for the answer. Okay, what provides evidence of de Broglie's hypothesis? Uh, well, that would be the electron diffraction, whether it's electron diffraction off a nickel crystal or um, it could be off a thin metal foil. If we're getting electron diffraction patterns, that's evidence of de Broglie's hypothesis that matter has a wavelength and a wave nature. Okay, so let's summarize what we've, what we've said. First of all, de Broglie predicts that particles do have a wave nature and the wavelength that will describe their wave nature will be given by Planck's constant divided by the momentum of that particle. The second thing we talked about was that Davison and Germer came along. They did electron diffraction experiments and they showed not only that electrons have a wavelength but that the wavelength predicted by de Broglie was correct. We did a, sh a small calculation with a wine bottle and we showed that macroscopic objects have wavelengths that are just too small to ever see their wave nature because there's nothing in the universe that's as small as their wavelength. And then finally we determined the de Broglie wavelength of an electron that's uh, accelerated through a voltage V and we derived the equation that lambda would be equal to H divided by the square root of 2 times M the mass of the electron times the charge of the electron times the voltage that the electron gets accelerated through. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.